Thank you for tuning in to the Ultimate Coach Podcast, a companion to the transformative book, The Ultimate Coach, written by Amy Hardison and Alan D. Thompson. Each conversation is designed to be a powerful wake-up call, reminding us of what's possible for you and your life. So if you're on a journey to expand your state of being, this podcast is for you. Welcome to another episode of the Ultimate Coach Podcast. I'm Meredith Bell, one of your hosts, and I'm delighted to have as my guest today, Jim Wilcher. Welcome to the show, Jim. Hi, Meredith. Thank you for inviting me to have this conversation with you. I know it's going to be very special for our listeners. And to set the context, I want to give them a little bit of information about your background and also what you're doing today. I think that'll lead in nicely to some of the things that I know we want to discuss today. Jim is a seasoned advisor and coach with a colorful past. With a career spanning over three decades, he's been the architect behind marketing triumphs for global giants like Apple, AT&T, DHL, IBM, and Microsoft, crafting success stories in LA and Seattle. But Jim's journey wasn't without its trials. In 2003, his Seattle agency teetered on the brink of collapse, prompting 15 years of introspection and personal growth. Jim emerged not just as a coach, but as a beacon of insight and resilience. Today, Jim is dedicated to guiding CEOs and executive teams to achieve peak performance, foster well-being, and cultivate harmonious work-life balance. So Jim, of course, the curiosity comes in with this period of time when things didn't go so well for you. And I would really like to explore that initially. If you could tell us about that story of what happened and what you learned over those years of introspection. Yeah, thanks for that question. It's a story that I like to tell because I like to remind myself. And I like to remind myself of my vulnerability as a human being and the lesson I learned from what occurred in my life. Yeah, I found that I was pretty good at uh, visual arts and communication and brought that into my as the business that I would develop. And I went to school in LA and when I graduated a couple of years out after working for somebody else, I created my own business. It was just a free, I was a freelancer. And then I developed a partnership with somebody I went to school with who was just getting into desktop computers. And we together pioneered a lot along with other people, many others, the whole desktop revolution for communication design and which then led us into working with CD-ROM and then interactive structures and poised right at the edge at the perfect time for the internet. And so this was a real riding of the wave with this changeover, a big change in the industry and developed a business in LA with my partner, sold that to my partner, moved back to Seattle. My heart was in Seattle. My wife who was my fiance at the time, we wanted to have kids. And we thought, you know, that it was pretty rough in LA in the 80s. <laughs> it was a lot of victimizing. So we moved to Seattle and started up the business anew. And it built it up over 20 years. And it was just going great. We were small and then we got a little bigger and then we got bigger clients and then we got bigger space. And then we went downtown Seattle and got bigger, nicer space. And we're in the agency district and, you know, big clients and great employees, employees we loved and a great culture. And everything was really going well. But I found myself in the corner office overlooking the Puget Sound at night, late at night with these ferry boats, like looking like chandeliers floating across the Puget Sound. Gorgeous. Couldn't ask for anything more, right? But I could hear myself 
audibly starting to say, I hate this because I was still at work. I was the only one still there because I had to feed the engine. And there was something a little off. So at one point I went home late. My family was in bed and there was a CD-ROM on the CD player. And it said, girls just want to have fun. I plugged that in and it was pictures of my daughters with their nanny. My wife and I both worked and we spent an hour commuting each way and a lot of time at work. And it was all these pictures of my daughter to the song, Cindy Lauper's song, Girls Just Want to Have Fun. And I broke down and bawled. I mean, I really lost it. I really, my God, I don't even know my girls. What is the price I'm paying here? Now, that's the setup because it wasn't long afterwards, there was an answer. And the answer came in the form of one big client going dark on us. Later turned out they were being purchased by a bigger company. And uh, then another company, a uh, national bank, went belly up. So all of a sudden we had a huge overhead and very little income coming in. The business as a physical structure imploded. It literally imploded. And we went virtual. I had to let people go. It was very tough. But what really was tough is what also imploded. And that was my ego. I didn't really realize what it was, but it was just a vacuum, an emptiness, a hollowness. A, 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 it was beyond burnout. It was, and I was still running the business virtually, but, and it, it was so difficult for me to even do the work. I had to have music on. If I didn't have music on, I could not do the work. And that went for about two years. I was just absolutely miserable. And there was a repeating pattern in my head of thoughts. You're a failure. You didn't do this. You should have done that. And and I couldn't turn it off. So at some point, I don't know when it was, about two years after that, something happened and everything quieted in my mind. It just went quiet. And I would find myself standing in the kitchen, just standing there for maybe two minutes before I realized, and I was just standing in this bliss of presence. Something happened to me and I couldn't explain it. And that was the start of a journey that I took for the next, and it's still on, 15 years ago, I started it. And I started meditating. And in the meditation, I learned what what this thing that had occurred to me was, this, this presence and the power of it. And that, that power of presence turned into a long-term study and practice that where I deconstructed everything inside of me over time through journaling and meditation to deconstruct the conditioning that had set up all the issues that created the, and supported the ego, the identity I had identified myself with the company as myself. And the company as myself was the problem. That was my purpose. My purpose was the, the value of me was tied to the success of the company. And when it went away, my value went away. I had to rebuild myself. And so this is where the creation came in. And in the being, we talk about creation a lot. I didn't know that. I didn't have that word, but that's what I was doing. And I was rebuilt kind of blank, went to a blank slate. Now, the blank to get to the blank slate, I had to forgive myself. I had to do a lot of self-forgiveness. And I, I also went through and did a lot of forgiveness in family and friendships and different things. It was all mostly internally and in my journal. And that cleared the slate. I put things in the past, and then I developed a blank slate to start building off of. Now, what came out of that is one year, I saw, well, it was a little more than a year that I journaled my highest intention. And what came out of that after a year was two things, actually, two things. I'm also an artist, so I have an art practice and I'm a sculptor. And so it was to impact the world through my art, but, but even more so impact the world through my ability to work with people to share with them a similar kind of process 
to be able to move out of a self-focused identity, an ego-driven only identity, and to open that up to see that we actually aren't the fiction of our identity. We're much more than that. And without the fiction of our identity holding us back, we can create things that are really purposeful to us. And when we're purposely driven, we're inspired. And when we're inspired, we can do beautiful things and serve the world for a better purpose. That's really what came out of this is that inward me focus got flipped, turned inside out and became the outward me serving. And that showed up in friendships and family and many, many things. And then Judy Thurston, who is the grandmother, she calls herself, of the being movement. Uh, I guess that would make Eric Blafholm the, the grandfather <laughs> because he, he's also very instrumental. But she was telling me about this guy that she met and uh, rode in a car from Arizona to LA or one way or the other and had like a six hour ride with this guy named Steve Hardison. And he's really amazing. And, and, uh, and then he's got this book coming out and she's saying, I'm going to, I, I told Steve, I wanted to do a launch for his book. Steve said, no, I don't want to launch for my book. And she said, well, I wanted to do it. And so anyway, the story goes, she did it. And that was the, the first being event a couple of years ago in Arizona, the launch of Steve's book, everything that we're talking about and all your podcasts and all the people online and sharing stories and doing beautiful things together are a result of that. Well, we would get let together. Me, let me pause before we go further into that. I want to not lose some of the, the key nuggets that I think are in your story. And to me, one of them is the fact that you really went deep after all these things happened and you recognized your role you it sounds to me like you you took responsibility for what happened as you went through this process of digging deeper and identifying you know who you really were and and where things you know went off the rails there as a business owner myself i could identify with some of the challenges that you faced as we've had ups and downs over the decades. And I just know that it took a lot of courage for you to do that, not give up. You know, there's that initial feeling bad about how things turned out and then realizing as you did over time, they really worked for your benefit because of all the lessons you extracted from there, the digging you did to discover you know, who you really are and what your capabilities are that led to your creating this beautiful purpose and intention that you're now living out with your clients. But before we jump into the work you're doing with your clients, let's go back to your your sharing of the launch of the Ultimate Coach book, because it's all tied together. Yes, it is. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great consolidation, Meredith. I I'm sure it's a story that, you know, you hear about burnout so much. So I'm sure it's a story that many people can relate to, just as you said, you can with the challenges of business. And so never give up, right? I mean, there's always a way through and it may be a beautiful gift like it was for me. And I would just say that in terms of the the gift is that I went virtual and I worked at home and I got to watch my girls and be with my girls growing up. So girls just want to have fun and daddy just wants to have fun with them, I think was uh, the, the new theme. Um, but Ju going back to Judy, she's just such a lovely person and, and her husband, Eric, love him so much. And so I married her sister and we get together at Christmas, usually not every year, but we had the last few years. And in December, we um, talked and I said, you know, I was kind of in between and I'm not sure what I'm going to really exactly going to be doing next. And she said, well, you know, there's this guy, my coach, and he has this program and it starts January 12th. And this is like December, I don't know, 20th or something. And she said, I'll, I'll send you the information. So this person was Rich Habits. Her coach is Rich Habits. 
And Rich Habits is just this, uh, I came to learn this amazing man and fabulous coach. And he has a program called Being a Trusted Advisor that I went through. And I ended up working with Steve, uh, excuse me, with uh, Rich all year. And it was just transformational. I realized at one point that this is the thing that I didn't know that I was looking for. But of course, Judy in her all-knowing infinite wisdom knew before I knew. And I say the same thing really with Rich. He even knew before I knew because I was just putting my toes in the water at first. And Rich has a way of uh, coaching in which it's osmotic. In other words, like by osmosis in a way, almost. It's just like we're hanging out and talking and sure he's sharing all kinds of nuggets, but something just happens and it's it's really quite magical. I, I, I can't explain it except to say that it is being, <laughs> right? It is his being. And I always asked, well, what is, you know, I'd asked him a few times, what is being? He'd never answer that question because to answer the question would be to limit it. And I realized that, ah, okay. And so what he really allowed is he allowed the space and he believed, he took a stand for me and he believed in my inner source of bringing out and revealing what being is for me. So this led to me committing and saying, oh yeah, okay. I, I think this is right for me. There's all kinds of coaching. There's there's life coaching and different kinds of coaching, but business really made sense to me because that has been my my world for a very long time. And it wasn't without a lot of confusion and it wasn't without a lot of questioning and even some doubt from time to time. But then when I decided, it was like, yeah, this makes sense. This makes sense because I always worked with my clients uh, developing a brand it was off. I would tell people, I've told people for 30 years when I work with a client like that, you know, a leader, a marketing director or something, it's basically the first thing we need to do is got to do the Freud thing. You know, somebody's on the couch and somebody's in the chair and now we've got to go through because it's an identity. A corporate brand is an identity. It's an identity that represents the entire company, like a person's identity. So that's a very interesting process because all the assumptions and ideas about what it should be, what we want it to be. Well, it's not really, but we're going to cover that up and, you know, and still say it's true. All that kind of stuff has to get fleshed out and it has to come to this terms of what is really true for you. In this case, coaching is for literally you, the person in front of me who's being coached or the team. In, in branding, it was with the a leader, sometimes it's an entrepreneur, a leader, a CEO. And so it's always a cathartic process that is the branding process. So it was a perfect fit really in so many ways. Oh, it, it, I can see that. I hadn't thought about the, the work to do the branding and the identity as a kind of evolution of, or a, a parallel with being because you're looking at who are we being as a company and who do we want to be known for? And also what just hit me is where do we want to come from? You know, we're always talking in the being movement about a place to come from. And so a company that has a brand, it's a place to come from to be that. And that's what I am guessing you are helping your clients do as you're working with them today, not so much on the brand identity, but their own personal identity and stepping into who they can be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's such a great analogy. It's certainly removing all that which is not the authentic self and being in integrity. A brand that's not in integrity just falls apart after a while, has to be re you know rebranded that's what rebranding is sometimes yeah so so yeah it's kind of like a rebranding process in a way but but you know it's so there's this you know meditation i mentioned before but really what's going on there is it's mindfulness and so we hear this term mindfulness a lot these days but what the heck is mindfulness mindfulness in the very basic 
level is knowing what's what. Now, there's a Warner Earhart distinction, this this idea of distinctions in Warner Earhart's teachings, which is, you know, how being beings grown out of that, uh, out of the work he did first with in Est, later in Landmark. Of course, Steve Hardison was very involved in that, and and he Steve does his own thing with that, and he takes it and makes you know his own beautiful stew out of that. But I was exposed to the S training back in the eighties when I was in my late twenties, so I had this uh, you know a, a fairly good dive into the S teachings. You know, not just a single course, but you know several courses, number of courses. And it it was what really allowed me to step up and become the leader I needed to be to grow the business that it eventually imploded that led to a new reintroduction and a revisit to being once again. So now the being revisiting through the book of being and through the group and through work with Rich and, and Judy, who are very steeped in, in being and the other folks I've come to know and love, so many that I know I've come to know and love. It's like at the university level now for me. And it's discovering all kinds of things about this this component of what being is and adding that to the mindfulness. So mindfulness is knowing what's what. And distinctions are determining what's what is what from something else. Right, so they're kind of the they're really the same thing. It's awareness, the level of awareness that we develop to be able to to know what we're thinking, when we're thinking it, or soon afterwards, and then know what we're feeling, the emotions, when we're feeling it, or soon after, gives us the ability to distinguish what's happening in a conversation as it's going on and in business then we have the ability to not react because we have an expanded level of awareness. And this also couples with the ego, this ego piece, where if I'm really focused on my, when I was really focused on myself, more so, I, I'm not free of the ego, I'm not proclaiming that, but I have a much better awareness about the ego's role when it's playing, or I can look back and say, oh, that was ego came up, got, got me messed up. Ego has a, uh, has a healthy function, but just using it colloquial this way, the ego has, has this identity focus. And if I'm identity focused with my wants and my needs, then my being is going to be that way. My speech is going to be that way. My energy is going to be that way. The way I show up with somebody, the way I look at them, the way I pay attention to them, do I turn the, to them and not pay attention to my monitor anymore when they come into the office? Or do I take my phone and put it down and be available for people to be so we can be together and be having a human relationship without all these outside distractions? So this distinction of what is most important, is it the work or is it the people? It's not really either or because they're the same thing. And a, a business is a, I've learned from this book by Steve Zafron, another gentleman, I can't remember his name right now, that wrote it, The Three Laws of Power. And they, they state that a business is a network of conversations. So that means people talking and a conversation is not just our words, it's What's said and what's not said, it's our it's all the nonverbal communication. And so really that's the place where a lot of the work I do starts. It starts in presence, like being able to be present, understanding the self, the the factor of what the self is. So I can have a aware, I can be aware that I'm aware. I can be aware of what I'm doing. I can be aware that I have an ego that sometimes jumps up and gets in the way, and that's very helpful. And then I can be present for another person or a group of people. 
And then I can be aware that I want to jump in and say something or get my idea across. I can be, you know, so this is the kind of work that's the blocking and tackling to use a American football term. And then, of course, that that creates the condition for the higher level relationship work to happen where innovation and creativity for the building of uh, safe spaces so that people feel included and can bring out their best because they feel safe. But it's a series of building blocks of greater productivity, less inefficiency, less wasting of time and effort, better well-being. The well-being piece in business is super important. It's, it's been recognized. Empathy is now being really focused on. Emotional intelligence is being highly prioritized. There's uh, mindfulness be coming into a lot of organizations being prioritized. And so I see I, what I'm excited about is I see business needing to still do business and they need to keep moving ahead and doing all the things they do, but they're embracing some, uh, some and to some degree or uh, even others a lot of what surpasses or cuts under or cuts through a lot of the drama that happens in business that is problematic for people and then creates a bad work-life balance. It comes, it goes home with them. And this is problematic because businesses could be way more efficient and they're heading that way. And my mission is to, you know, be a part of this army that helps boost that along, helps usher it along. Well, I love the fact that you can bring your past experience in business to your clients. So it gives you a lot of credibility as an advisor, you know, a trusted advisor, because I would think it, it accelerates the speed with which they start trusting you when they hear where you are coming from and your own growth, learnings, experience, and showing them a better way. I want to explore some more about your work with clients, but first I want to back up because I know you attended the Ultimate Coach or the Ultimate Experience in Phoenix this past January, and you had some pretty important, I think, insights that you gained and important experiences that you had, and I would love for you to share what those were, because I think that would be of great value to our listeners. Okay. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you, Meredith. Something very close to my heart it happened at the event, and I didn't know what to expect. And, you know, I had some thoughts across my mind. It's like, I wonder if I'll get a chance to meet Steve Hardison, you know? Uh, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I wonder what that'll be like. So I was staying with Judy and Eric, who put that whole amazing event on and it was flawless. It was um, it's just beautiful. And the structure of the being with different categories and the speakers were all absolutely beautiful. The day before the event, so this is Friday, Judy says, Friday late afternoon, do you want to go with us to this kind of pre-event? We're blessing the space. And would you like to go down with us? And I said, oh yeah, that would be nice. So the night before the event started on Saturday, I went and I was stand. There was Casey. I knew Casey. I, I was talking with him, and Steve Hardison walked up and talked to Casey for a minute, and turned to me and said hello, and and I made you know an old an old business gesture of holding my hand up to shake his hand, and he he just had his hands out stretched out in front of him, and he just moved in for this really beautiful hug. And it was so tender. I mean, it was just, oh my gosh, it was so heartfelt in this embrace and this sense of belonging that just rushed through my body. Now, I'd always heard about Steve and, you know, and I had certain impressions of Steve by reading the book, like, oh my gosh, that guy's pretty, pretty uh, aggressive at times, you know? And, but, you know, I realized that he is so compassionate and so caring 
And what I learned about him was that he has an intensity because he has an, a strong desire to really make a difference. And part of that is a whole other set of qualities that are so beautiful as well that go along with that. So he's just very multidimensional. Now, we went into the room and Judy said, okay, we're just going to go around and touch the tables and, and bless the tables. And so we had done that and for a little bit. Uh, music was playing and I was standing next to Rich Habits and Steve Hardison walked up and he said, hey guys, will you come with me over? There's a, a lady standing over there against the wall and she's just all by herself. Let's go over and give her a group hug. I was like, oh, wow, cool. So we go over and Steve and Rich, who are both very tall, basically get her uh, on each of her sides. And I was in front and we, we just had this group hug that lasted, I don't know, two, three, four minutes. And this lady, after a bit, she turned and put, I'm going to get a little emotional, <laughs> buried her head in Rich's chest and just bawled. And a little bit later, she brought her head back forward and I put my head against her forehead and there was something going on there that was really beautiful. Well, we we finished that and we went back and stood in an oval and all held hands and there was a mic and a few people, Judy spoke and somebody else spoke and Steve spoke and then Steve said, anybody else? And you know, I just had this urge inside of me. So I said, yeah, Steve, can you hand me the microphone? And I said, well, something to the effect of, and I have to be standing next to her in the circle. This lady, Car Carrie, Carrie Rickenbaugh is her name. She does the Friday live being broadcast. Okay, so I didn't know her before. And I said, well, I just want to say that I fell in love with this lady tonight. And she's right here next to me. And I just have one question I'd like to ask her. What is your name? <laughs> and she took the mic and she just talked about how she had never felt anything like that before. She had never been accepted in that way, even in her family. And I've been in touch with Carrie and it's changed her life. Now, that all came about because Steve Hardison was attuned and attending. And he created something in the moment, like he knew there was something needed. Maybe he didn't know exactly what it was. And it was the perfect thing for this woman. And it was the perfect thing for me. It impacted me greatly. That was a very beautiful moment. And he just set the tone for the entire event because the next two days, I call it the being concert. You know, the concert you went to that just everybody was in sync. Everybody was vibing at the same rhythm and pace and, 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 you know, love and caring and openness. That was two, there was two days of that. Yeah. And it was, to me, I walked away and I thought, okay, now this is the, this is the example of what's possible in the world. And Ankush Jane talked when he talked about the practicality of being being generous and being a giving and serving person, just not in client relationships, but just as you go through life. But he also talked about his vision, which is expansion of global consciousness. And I felt like that's what I experienced was a, a sample, a Petri dish of what is possible in that that event had a meta message. And then within it, there was all of these speakers, all of these people in the audience that were, there was so much happening that it almost is like, I can't remember a darn thing of individual things. I mean, I can, but it wasn't so much about that. Everybody who spoke was brilliant. The audience was amazing and the interactions that the audience had. But what was there was and a feeling and an energy and a possibility. There's a possibility. If you haven't been to a being event, if you haven't been to an ultimate being event, get yourself to one. And the one that's coming up is Birmingham. 
it'll be in, I think, May. I would do whatever it takes to get there because I watched Caroline Hughes. I was uh, working with her in a small group with Rich for the entire year of 2023. And I so I met her in the beginning of 23. I watched her go to India. I watched what she came back like. And I was like, wow, what is that? And I couldn't really relate. And I went to Arizona and I, I realized it is transformative. This is almost like a model that I see being important as a way to bring the harmony and energy of multiple people together to affect transition and transformation. So anyway, yeah, if you have a chance, do that. That's a great, wow, great testimony of being there. And I want to go back to the very, the night before when you were talking about Steve picking up on this person. You know, from the book, we know he's a highly sensitive person. What he picks up on, though, is available to all of us to notice and see with others, you know, and I think that to me, the beautiful lesson from that story that you shared of that night is that all of us have noticing that we can do if we're paying attention and going back to what you said about this awareness that we can develop, awareness about ourselves, also awareness of those around us. What are we picking up? What are we sensing? Because if we don't pay attention to that, we won't see it. And what, to me, Steve has developed is this incredibly finely honed mastery of that because he's practiced it for so many years. It's natural to him and it can become natural and automatic for each one of us if we work on developing that skill and paying attention and sensing what somebody might be feeling. And to me, I just love what you've shared about that event and want to reinforce your encouragement for people to attend the May event at the end of May. And there's information in the Ultimate Coach community about that particular event if people want to be able to go. I, You know, Jim, in kind of summarizing what we've talked about, your own journey from your business to the work you do today with clients and the impact that the event you attended, the lasting impact it has had on you. I would just like you to take a minute to share what has that done for the way you interact with your clients today? No, it, what you just said in terms of the, picking up on the sensing what's going on is amplified the importance of that as a modality. So the modality of keeping that channel very open as the dialogue is going on and especially in between the dialogue so that the intuition, the factor of intuition the factor of the heart-centeredness are able to, I give over trust to that. I give over now a lot more trust to that, that that actually, the words are important, but they're almost like a, they're almost to facilitate. They facilitate and carry. It's a baseline, the baseline in the music And the other instruments of the music are the sensing so that it's a package of being. So just being with somebody might in some cases be more powerful. Or what I'm finding is sending us a a surprise text that's just very simple, like, you know, hoping that your event goes good today or something like that. And so the sense of belonging, so this sensing, so I'm highly, I'm also a highly sensitive person. It turns out Rich habits is too, <laughs> funny thing. So, so this 
high sensitivity is used to be a curse because I always tried to cover it up. I wasn't being macho, right? But now I really, I watched Steve, you know, I read the book, I read the chapter on that. I have watched rich work and I'm really now taking it in as the super, as a superpower. And my ideas are going forward with coaching with clients and teams is to de- bring a lot more of that in, not just in me showing up sensing, but actually that being, I really feel like that's one of the most important pieces to bring into business it, with leaders, most absolutely with leaders, but also with the team because they're sensing individually, but then there's the field, the field of the sensing. So when two people, so we're having a dialogue right now. I'm talking, then you talk, and I listen, and you listen. So is the the conversation me or you or me and you? Provisionally, yes, but it's be it's happening the space between us, and so a team that's able to sense, not just intellectually have discussions and problem solving, but open up and sense and allow for something else to open and come through that is not possible until that group sensing and and the energy space and sense of belonging and trust, and you can say anything in this space opens up, wow, all of a sudden, boom, there's a whole nother level of collaboration. All the basic collaboration stuff as the blocking and tackling that it builds on, and that as well. I think that's going to really change business. I think you're right. I love that. And you're so right when people feel that security, that safeness or safety in speaking up and allowing for these ideas to emerge what's possible. That's that's fantastic. Jim, this has been such a great conversation. I loved hearing about your own journey and the work you're doing today would not have been possible if you had skipped any of those steps that you went through because each one, it seems to me, has been an integral part of who you are today and what what you bring and who you are being with your clients and in the world. And I want to acknowledge you for that. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Meredith. I want to thank you. And I want to include you and all the amazing women that I met at the event. I've got to know in the Being Network. And I'm focusing on women because women are very important to me. I had a very strong mother, two older sisters that were like mothers, a younger sister. <laughs> I have two daughters. And there's there's something that's very important about the feminine the power of that the feminine energy brings. And this time that we're in right now, it's very important to step up as women. Actually, the men need to step aside and lift up, help the women, give them the space to come forward. And the energy and the empathy and the compassion and the caring is what is needed in the world today. And I want to highlight a couple of things at the event. It'll only take a second. I have to say this, Alok gave up time on the stage for Gabby, Gabby Puma. And Gabby Puma is a force. She is an absolute force of power for being. And as she says, spirit. And then also Rich. Rich had three powerful women on the stage with them, Caroline Hughes and Sarah Adani and Hina Khan. And they are all powerful women and doing amazing things. And there was a whole bunch of other women on the stage and in the audience doing powerful things. And Eric Lafon gave a lot of his time to his daughter. His daughter was just absolutely empowered to tell all of us parents how important it is to listen to their children, really listen to their children. And that generation is going to be the ones that really make the change. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Meredith. Well, that was a great addition. Thank you, Jim. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you. 
Thank you for joining us today. If there's someone you know who could benefit from this conversation, please share this episode with them. Also, check out our website, beingmovement.com. You'll find valuable resources and links to connect to an engaging and wonderfully supportive community. Together, we can inspire and support each other on the path to a greater understanding of being. Until next time, take care and be kind to yourself.